Hello, my lovely Rose Garden. This is Avalon. And Ray. And we're recording this episode kind of late in the evening, so I get the sense that our sleepiness will add to the possible derailments and <laughs> stupid humor. Um, Either that or just me going, oh, this is stupid, hurry, I want to end it. Yeah. <laughs> it's one or the other. And also, like... Apropos of nothing, really, but I think it's pretty obvious that Ray's pronouns are he, him, but uh, mine are they, them, so just something to keep in mind. I don't mention it very frequently, but I am the gender queer, and I prefer they, them. Okay, chapter 23. Do you even remember chapter 22? Um, I remember that they were all like, oh, BT dubs were going to be skipping some... Yeah, that's trials. right. They just like skipped a bunch of trials. And... Yeah. And I'm just like, okay then. And I think one of our patrons in the Patreon Discord, uh, which you can get access to for now only $1 a month, I added the Thorn tier, mm. which gets you access to the patron exclusive Discord channels and your name in the video description credits. Uh, you do not get early access to videos or patron exclusive content at the Thorn level, though. That starts at $2. Rosebud, yeah. which is $2. And then the rewards just get increasingly better from there. Especially with us having a new book coming out, hopefully by the end of the year. So if that is something you're interested in supporting, or if you want to support us making audio adaptations of our books... Please, 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 please consider donating to Patreon. I have a bunch of tiers that are, you know, I never want to say low because it really does help. Any amount of mm -hmm. monetary support and even just following the Patreon, which will get you access to the free channels on Discord. You won't get the patron channels, but you'll get the free stuff. Mm -hmm. Um even that is just really like supportive in a morale boosting way that people care about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But in terms of Patreons, you know, we recommend that you have your tiers be this amount of money. I have $1, $2 and $5 tiers, which is what Patreon considers to be like affordable. Mm -hmm. I do have a few higher ones, but Let's be honest, like, I know that my audience does not have a lot of disposable income. Um, so one, two, or five dollars a month. We all do just be... Literally less than the cost of a Starbucks drink. Broke-ass millennials and Gen Zers. And it's only once a month, so it's, you know, it's not that bad. Um, I think Patreon now also offers yearly subscriptions where they actually discount it a little bit if you pay for like a year up front hmm. uh, i haven't really looked into that so i don't yeah, I, have, I don't, I don't really know about much about stuff. that uh and if you're like yeah i want to support you guys but i don't want to do monthly patreon stuff you can always just buy my books they are available anywhere that books are sold online or you could donate to the coffee and that's just a one-time thing I also have my ebooks on coffee and it's a pay what you want minimum of a dollar. But if you feel like, yeah, I just want to give you guys $20, but I would also like to get a book. You can do that on coffee and pay whatever you want for the ebooks. Mm -hmm. So it's just some options, you know, just putting this up in front right here and let's get into it. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening to my spiel. I'm trying to get better at it. <laughs> trying to do the whole YouTuber thing. Danny Mata really inspires me with his... Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't do, like, a fun intro this time, but Danny Mata's a lot of fun. Please don't disappoint me, Danny Mata. Please don't become problematic. <laughs> I can't take it. I can't take another one of my favorite creators being problematic. Like, in a real way, not in a, oh, they ship two characters that have a two-year age gap way, but in a, like, actual real people were harmed kind of way. Yeah. See, this is why I wanted to do this late at night, because you're getting my real thoughts now. <laughs> Alyssacles gaped at the ground. Oh. She knew these sharp gray rocks, knew how they crunched beneath her feet. That's why I love Nestle Crunch. 
how they smelled after the rain. Oh, I love the way rocks smell when they're wet. Yeah. How they could so easily cut into her skin when she was thrown down. The rocks stretched for miles, rising into jagged, fang-like mountains that pierced the cloudy sky. In the frigid wind, she had little clothing to protect her from its stinging gusts. Yeah. See, I feel like that sentence could have been written better. I feel like it would have been more concise if she had little clothing to protect her from the frigid wind's sting. Or the sting of the frigid wind. Yeah. You know, just a little. Just... These are very small touches, but these are the kinds of things that my editor comes to me with, and I'm always just profoundly amazed at how much better it reads with just these few minor adjustments to a sentence. Have I mentioned that my editor is great, by the way? I don't think she watches these videos, but love you, girly. Uh, bestie. Forever. Such a good editor. Oh, my God. As she touched the dirty rags, her stomach rose in her throat. If she fucking throws up, not even a paragraph into this chapter. I swear to God. I swear to God, <laughs> I'm going to throw up. What had happened? She pivoted, shackles clanking, and took in the desolate waste that was Endovier. She had failed, failed and been sent back here. Okay, so this is definitely going to be a dream sequence, yeah, but man, what like if? A nightmare sequence. What if real? <laughs> there was no chance of escape. She had tasted freedom, come so close to it, and now Alyssa Clee screamed as excruciating pain shot down her back, barely heralded by the crack of the whip. She fell onto the ground, stone slicing into her raw knees. Get on your feet, someone barked. Tears stung her eyes, and the whip creaked as it rose again. She would be killed this time. She would die from the pain of it. The whip fell, slicing into bone, reverberating through her body, making everything collapse and explode in agony, shifting her body into a graveyard, a dead, <laughs> and then it cuts off with a little tilde, and I'm like, My stomach is a graveyard. <laughs> graveyard stomach. My favorite metal band. I, I'm not opposed to a dream sequence. Yeah. Uh, especially a nightmare sequence that is probably going to lead to some fluff. Like, you know, A+. plus. I do. Mm, tasty. Uh delicious little snack mm -hmm. but because i already hate her i don't i'm care. just like taking delight in the idea of her failure because again the tonal whiplash from one chapter one scene one paragraph to the next in this book like am i supposed to really care about this trauma or is this just supposed to make her seem more badass like i don't i don't know man i don't know point being i don't care yeah Alyssa Clee's eyes flew open. She panted. Are you, someone said beside her, and she jerked. Where was she? It was a dream, said Kaol. She stared at him, then looked around the room, running a hand through her hair. Rifthold. Rifthold, that's where she was. In the glass castle. No, in the stone castle beneath. Okay, so the stone castle is underneath? I thought it was like to the side. Like, I thought they went through a hallway to get to the... Whatever. It doesn't matter. I think... What was it? Wasn't the glass castle, like, on the outside of it, and then, like, on the inside was the original stone castle? Yeah, like, they built the glass onto it, but now it's making it seem like they build it on top of it, and they go maybe they, up? Maybe they also put put it out? Like, I know it was supposed to go out, because it's, like, know. the part that's facing everything. So I maybe they also added height to it? I don't know. Who fucking knows? Who cares? I mean, obviously, I'm I'm making a fuss, but whatever. Moving on. <sighs> she was sweating, and the sweat on her back felt uncomfortably like blood. Just say the sweat on her back felt uncomfortably like blood. You don't need she was sweating and the sweat. Yeah. I feel like that's a pretty basic... Yeah. I would have caught that one. That one wouldn't have even made it to my editor. Yeah. She felt dizzy, nauseated, too small and too large all at once. Though her windows were shut, an odd draft from somewhere in her room kissed her face, smelling strangely of roses. Elysicles, it was a dream, the captain of the guard said again. You were screaming. He gave her a shaky smile. I thought you were being murdered. <laughs> Man, he wishes. <laughs> He's like, that would have been so great to be rid of you. <laughs> Elysicles reached around to touch her back beneath her nightshirt. She could feel the three ridges and some smaller ones, but nothing, nothing. 
come on. What a weird way to cut off. Yeah. Like, just say in some smaller ones. Like, what? This, okay. Apparently, when I'm tired, I get smarter. So, you're going to probably get a lot of editing notes um, that hopefully will be useful to you because odds are good that if you're watching this, you probably dabble in writing of your own. So, here's some editing advice. You don't always need to end a negative thought with a M dash. Like once or twice is, you know, it's fine in moderation, but also I'm noticing we have not had nearly the amount of M dashes as will appear later in A Court of Thorns and Roses, but this chapter in particular has had one, two, three, four, five, six M dashes so far, and I'm not even two pages in. Wow. So. It's beginning. It won't become as... I don't think it's going to be as bad in this book as it will become in later books. Mm -hmm. Where it's like multiple per page, almost every page. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm seeing the start of the trend. Oh, nope, there's seven. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, being whipped. She shook her head to remove the memory from her mind. Again, just remove the memory. We know the memory is in her mind because it's a memory. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here? It's not even dawn. She crossed her arms, flushing slightly. It's Sawin. I'm canceling our training today, but I wanted to see if you plan to attend the service. Also, one of my uh, followers slash patrons who actually, like, learned Irish, like, actually took a course, says that you is also a slender vowel, maybe? Um, I, I know I made like a note of how Samhain was spelled before. I still think it's dumb. Mm -hmm. I still hate that they changed the spelling. And I think this episode might be going up around when Samhain is. Wow. So, <laughs> nice timing. Good job, me. <laughs> Less than Samhain, everybody. Yeah, let's see. Uh, chapter 19 just went up. So publicly, obviously, we record these about a month in advance and you get them a month early if you're a patron. So this will be 20, 21, 22, 23. Okay, so it's not Samhain yet by the time that this one goes live, but it will be in a couple weeks. Okay. So an early Happy blessing. Early. <laughs> early blessings to you. Yeah. Today's what is Samhain? Today, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's stupid. Why has no one mentioned it? Is there a feast tonight? Why has no one mentioned it? Bitch, don't you have a calendar? Didn't, didn't they mention it Yeah, they, the uh, other chapter? Yeah, they did. Maybe not to her. Maybe it was they were talking but to someone But still, else. it's like, bitch, don't you have a calendar? <laughs> Clearly, they've been talking about it. Yeah. Like, other characters have been talking about it. She knows that it's autumn. What what normally happens in autumn, bitch? Could she have become so enmeshed in the competition that she'd lost track of time? Man, I wish we had the chance to be enmeshed in the competition. Yeah. Would be nice. Would be fun. Would be nice if we got to see all the competition. He <sighs> frowned. Of course, but you're not invited. <laughs> of course. And will you be summoning the dead to you this haunted night? Or lighting a bonfire with your companions? I don't partake in any such superstitious nonsense. You're not fun! <laughs> Be careful, my cynical friend, she warned, putting a hand in the air. The gods and the dead are closest to the earth this day. They can hear every nasty comment you make. Are you enjoying my co charmed comic emphasis? <laughs> yeah. I feel the need to remind everyone that I am... Putting the emphasis on the wrong word on purpose. <laughs> yeah. He rolled his eyes. It's a silly holiday to celebrate the coming of winter. The bonfires just produce ash to cover the fields. As an offering to the gods to keep them safe. As a way to fertilize them. It can be both, bitch. Like, okay, but at least this does actually feel in line with Kael's character. Mm -hmm. Though I suppose that it would also feel in line with his character if he did strictly observe the traditions. Like, Kaol is probably the best written character in this book, but that does not change the fact that he is still fairly vague. 
Yeah. Alyssa Cleese pushed back the covers. So says you, she said as she stood. She adjusted her drenched nightgown. She reeked of sweat. He snorted, following after her as she walked. I never took you for a superstitious person. How does that fit into your career? She glared at him over her shoulder before she strode into the bathing chamber, Kayal close behind. She paused on the threshold. Are you going to join me? She said, and Kayal stiffened, realizing his error. He slammed the door in response. Alyssa Cleese found him waiting in her dining room when she emerged, her hair dripping water onto the floor. Don't you have your own breakfast? You still haven't given me an answer. An answer to what? She sat down across the table and spooned porridge into a bowl. All that was needed was a heap, no, three heaps of sugar, and some hot cream and... Again, more M-dash abuse. <laughs> Are you going to temple? I am allowed to go to temple, but not to the feast. When, when did he ask that? When did he ask if she was going to temple? Did he just... I, okay, I wanted to see if you planned to attend the service, and then... Okay, so he did ask. Yeah. I just forgot that fast. Mm -hmm. Because he asked the question of, um, how does being superstitious fit into your job? So my assumption was that he was waiting for an answer to that question. The most recent question that he asked her that she had not answered that actually ended with a question mark. <laughs> Silly me. I should have known that he was referring to an earlier question that didn't get an answer. Religious observances shouldn't be denied to anyone. So he's religious but not superstitious. But I, th I see, my takeaway is that um, it's just like a law or whatever. Kind of similar to how it is here. Where it's like, yeah, you can't... If a prisoner is religious you can't deny them going to service in a prison or oh, okay, yeah. um it would be interesting though to see if he was you know, what is the religion of this world because they talk about gods and ghosts as if they're like one in the same i mean or essentially there's not a lot of difference uh dollars to donuts we will not get enough world building for it to matter. We're go just going to get little sprinklings of religion that is just vague enough to remind us of multiple religions that we have in our world, but nothing substantial, really. See, and this is where, <laughs> this is what's going to start happening because I've read Fourth Wing now. Um, one of my patrons requested that I read Fourth Wing, and I will probably, because it was patron requested, actually put up a video, like a long-form review of it. Um, long story short, if you haven't seen my quick review already, I didn't hate it. I didn't think it was fantastic, but it wasn't horrible. It was certainly a world and above more enjoyable than this, which I think a lot of people do compare like a lot of these young adult new adult fantasy with a lot of romance elements to mm -hmm. things like throne of glass and a court of thorns and roses yeah um and i can see the comparisons but at least in fourth wing we actually got the names of a couple of gods and what their domains are and there were like a few mentions of religious practice like the when someone dies in fourth wing you're supposed to burn all of their belongings because as they are now dead their belongings also belong to the god of the dead so you burn them okay you don't keep their stuff because that's seen as withholding what are now the god's possessions and it's it's a very short thing. They don't go into a lot of detail about the religious practices or anything. Because, assumedly, that's a very large topic that if you were going into in-depth world building would take a while to discuss. Mm -hmm. But at least it's something. You know, it's just a little tidbit of like, hey, here's one thing that they do. 
And here we've got Samhain, and it's like... Well, I mean, they're discussing... It's just Samhain. They're discussing some things, like, you know, the ashes being spread across the fields and whatnot. Um, so I would say it's kind of on par with that. But they're just like, oh, the gods. And it's like, which gods? What are their names? How many gods do you have? Mm. Like, they don't even have the names of the gods is what I'm getting at. Like, just that one tiniest little detail still elevates it to feeling like this is actually something that's a part of these characters' lives. Yeah. Whereas it's just, oh, the gods are listening. The gods. Blah, 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 blah. And it's like, is there a specific god that rules over the fields and farms and uses these ashes to protect I them? Mean, it or could, it is could it just be kind of a, like I said before, like in the whole amalgamation of different religious practices in our world combined into one to make it seem familiar. And I'm just spitballing here. It could just be that calling the gods by name is blasphemous, like the Christian god. But even then, like, fucking say that. I don't know why I'm getting so hung up on this. This is a stupid thing to be harping on about. Yeah. Clearly, she didn't give enough of a shit about the actual plot of this book to bother including it, so I don't know why I would think she would bother with world building. Yeah. <laughs> There's no plot here. Well, there's not no plot here. It's just not the plot that was advertised. There's a pl there's a plot and it's kind of sprinkled in. Like there's multiple plots going on and none of them are done very good and none mm. of them really get the attention that they need to actually form a coherent, solid plot. <laughs> when he wants me to go to bed. When he just came in here and she's rubbing up against my legs and she looks at me like, you're supposed to be in bed right now. Go to sleep. So Winnie can go to sleep. No, Winnie. I gotta talk about bullshit. Oh, well, I'll shit in that litter box. Uh, That'll clear you out real sorry. quick. <laughs> all right, all right. Religious observances shouldn't be denied to anyone. And a feast is? A show of debauchery. Oh, I see. She swallowed another bite. Oh, how she loved porridge. But perhaps it needed another spoonful of sugar. Well, then you don't love it, do you, bitch? Well, are you going? We need to leave soon if you are. No, she said through her food. Ew. Because we will not be privy to this world building. For someone so superstitious, you risk angering the gods by not attending. I imagine that an assassin would take more interest in the Day of the Dead. She made a demented face. The fuck does that mean? As she continued eating. I worship in my own way. Perhaps I'll make a sacrifice or two of my own. He rose, patting his sword. Mind yourself while I'm gone. Don't bother dressing too elaborately. Brulo told me that you're still training this afternoon. You've got a test tomorrow. Oh, she found a box. Yep. <laughs> She's just going to start causing problems now. Oh boy, a test. Will we get to see it? Probably not. Again? Didn't we just have one three days ago? She moaned. The last test had been javelin throwing on horseback, and a spot on her wrist was still tender. Fucking jousting, man. You'll be denied jousting forever. <sighs> Viewers at home who want to know the Avalon lore, I fucking love jousting. It is, like, the main reason I go to any Renaissance fair, and I have been deeply saddened that our local Ren fair does not have jousting, despite having really good grounds for it. Yeah, we have a whole horse... We have a whole stadium. Yeah, we have a whole horse riding arena. Like, they, they have rodeos here, and they don't do jousting. And I'm like, what the fuck, guys? The past two times that we've gone, there's been no jousting. I am fucking maidenless over here. We're just gonna go to another, uh... Which sucks, because the first Ren Faire that I went to had this really awesome jousting with, like, teams and sword fighting displays yeah. between the horses. So, you Honestly, know, the horses got a break. I gotta take you to Medieval Times at some point. I wanna go to Medieval Times. I, I would have so much fun... 
I would just be raucously calling for people to be beheaded. It would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you do at Medieval Times, but I will do it at Medieval Times. No, uh, but you have fun anyway. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I would have so much fun there. Um, I want to get all dressed in costume. I want to actually get into my Avalon cosplay, which if you watch any of my other videos and see the art of Avalon, the one that I made and also the one that my friend Air made, I want to cosplay that. That will be very fun to try and do. Um, but yeah, imagine me going as my little author Sona to medieval times. My little my little dragon person. That would be so fun. Alright, anyway. But he said nothing more and her chambers turned silent. Though she tried to forget it, the sound of the whip still snapped in her ears. POV switch tilde. <laughs> Grateful the service was finally over. Yeah, so fuck you on trying to figure out what any of the religious practices of this world are. Dorian Havillard strode by himself through the castle grounds. Religion neither convinced nor moved him, and after hours of sitting in a pew muttering prayer after prayer, he was in desperate need of some fresh air and solitude. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the religious practices thing, because apparently, and again, this was a commenter, like I was vaguely aware of this, but a commenter did bring it up at some point. Sarah J. Mass is Jewish. Is she? Yes. Um, and has actually been to Israel, and I don't know if she has posted her opinion on the conflict between Israel and Palestine, but people have claimed that she's on Israel's side. Mm. Um, I don't know much about her specific beliefs to comment on that, but... I would actually like to see more Jewish fantasy. And, again, this seems like a place where if she wasn't being a hack fraud, <laughs> she could have included some elements of Juda Judaism, like Jewish religious fantasy here. Mm. Just, it would be nice to have some representation that isn't just bastardized paganism or bastardized Catholicism in a fantasy setting. Yeah. I I would like to see more Jewish fantasy, personally, but... I would also like to see, um... And I'm not even Jewish. Actually well-written paganism in a fantasy setting. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be nice? Like, I'm all, I'm all for, you know, more diverse religious representation in books because in the West so much of it is just pseudo-Christian, pseudo-Catholicism. I'd like to see some other shit. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he sighed through his clenched teeth, rubbing a spot on his temple and headed through the garden. He passed a cluster of ladies, each of whom curtsied and giggled behind their fans. Dorian gave them a terse nod as he strode by. His mother had used the ceremony as a chance to point out all the eligible ladies to him. He'd spent the entire service trying not to scream at the top of his lungs. Doesn't he already have, like, a list? Yeah, he's got a list. Was she just pointing out, oh, that's so-and-so from your list? Maybe. Maybe. Dorian turned around a hedge, almost crashing into a figure of blue-green velvet. It was the color of a mountain lake, that gem-like shade that didn't quite have a name. You mean fucking peacock? Yeah. <laughs> it does have a name, bitch. It's peacock. Not to mention the dress was about a hundred years out of fashion. His gaze rose to her face and he smiled. Hello, Lady Lillian, he said, bowing, and then turned to her two companions. Princess Nehemia, boyfriend Westfall. Dorian eyed the assassin's dress again. The folds of fabric, like the flowing waters of a river, were rather attractive. You're looking festive. Elisicles' brows lowered. The Lady Lillian's servants were attending the service when she dressed, said Kaol. There was nothing else to wear. Of course, corsets required assistance to get in and out of, and the dresses were a labyrinth of secret clasps and ties. My apologies, my lord Prince. or sorry... <clears throat> thought it was Nehemia. My apologies, my lord prince. My lord prince, is that 
a term anyone would ever use. No, it's My not. lord, my prince, your highness. Yeah. Usually, like, lord title is reserved for something like lord father or lord brother when you're yeah. addressing your family members in a formal setting as a member of royal family. Which I know from Fire Emblem fanfiction. <laughs> God, I wish I was reading Fire Emblem fan fiction right now. <laughs> Alyssa Cleese said. Her eyes were bright and angry, and a blush rose to her cheeks. Why is she angry? I'm truly sorry my clothing's my clothes don't suit your taste. When did he say that? He said it was festive. I don't know. No, no, he said quickly, glancing at her feet. They were clad in red shoes, red like the winter berries beginning to pop out on the bushes. You look very nice, just a bit out of place. Centuries, actually. Century, you said it was only a hundred years. She gave him an exasperated look. He turned to Nehemia. Forgive me, he said in his best L way, which wasn't very impressive at all. How are you? Her eyes shone with amusement at his shoddy L way, but she nodded in acknowledgement. I am well, your highness, she answered in his language. Dorian's attention flicked at her two guards, who lurked in the shadows nearby, waiting, watching. Dorian's blood thrummed in his veins. For weeks now, Duke Parrington had been pushing for a plan to bring more forces into Elway, to crush the rebels so efficiently that they wouldn't dare challenge Adderland's rule again. Just yesterday, the Duke presented a plan. They would deploy more legions and keep Nehemia here to discourage any retaliation from the rebels not particularly inclined to add hostage-taking to his repertoire of abilities, Dorian had spent hours arguing against it. But while some of the council members had also voiced their disapproval, the majority seemed to think the Duke's strategy to be a sound one. Still, Dorian had convinced them to back off about it until his father returned. That would give him time to win over some of the Duke's supporters. Wow, what an intriguing political conflict that I wish we were actually getting to see play out. Wouldn't that be something? Anyway. Once again, <laughs> just feeling like, hey, in a better book, Nehemia and Dorian would be the star-crossed lovers who were trying to, like, get the king ousted from power so they could return Elway to independent rule. And, you know, there's not nothing here. The problem is that at every turn that we could possibly have a more interesting thing going on, we gotta it's shove not... In. Fucking Alyssa Cleese and her, her bullshit. Like, someone also pointed out what, I think it was um, in the patron chat, again, you know, shilling, but whatever. Uh, someone pointed out what a really interesting motivation for Dorian would have been. Yeah. And it just doesn't. Like, it doesn't. There is not nothing here. There are the shadows of a really good book here. It's just that they are only shadows. Yeah, they're focusing on entirely the wrong things for this to be engaging, possible, <laughs> fun, as entertaining literature. Though, I mean, I say that, but also, like, there are people who sing this book's praises, so I'm like, I feel like I'm missing something, but I'm just like, okay. Hey, all right. Like, okay, and again, I'm going to go back to Fourth Wing. Fourth Wing was not great prose by any means, but it was easy and fun to read. Mm. This isn't fun to read for me. This is just frustrating. Yeah. Like, I'm sure if I really wanted to take a deep dive on Fourth Wing, there's probably a ton of ways that it could be improved through slight changes, too. But at least what I did get to read was fun. Yeah. It was entertaining, if not excellent. You know, it didn't have to be the best Dragon Rider book, but it was at least fun. Yeah. Whatever. And I'm sure the inclusion of dragons helped you oh, immensely. enjoy it <laughs> immensely. a little more. <laughs> to be fair, it does have that going for it, so it's a little unfair to compare the two, but whatever. Now standing before her, Dorian quickly looked away from the princess. If he were anyone but the crown prince, he would warn her. But if Nehemia left before she was supposed to, the Duke would know who had told her and inform his father. How would he know? There were other council members on your side. 
Things were bad enough between Dorian and the king. He didn't need to be branded as a rebel sympathizer. Are you going to the feast tonight? Dorian asked the princess, forcing himself to look at her and keep his features neutral. Nehemia looked to Elysicles. Are you attending? Elysicles gave her a smile that only meant trouble. Unfortunately, I have other plans. Isn't that right, your highness? She didn't bother to hide the undercurrent of annoyance. Kale coughed, suddenly very interested in the berries and the hedges. Dorian was on his own. Don't blame me, Dorian said smoothly. You accepted an invitation to that party in Rifthold weeks ago. Her eyes flickered, but Dorian wouldn't yield. He couldn't bring her to the feast, not with so many watching. There would be too many questions, not to mention too many people. Keeping track of her would be difficult. Nehemia frowned at Elysicles. So you're not going? No, but I'm sure you'll have a lovely time, Elysicles said, then switched into Elway and said something else. Dorian's Elway was just competent enough that he understood the gist of it to be, His Highness certainly knows how to keep women entertained. Nehemia laughed and Dorian's face warmed. They made a formidable pair, God's help them all. Well, we're very important and very busy, Elysicles said to him, linking elbows with the princess. Perhaps allowing them to be friends was a horrible, dangerous idea. Yes, it is. Yeah. In fact. Pretty obviously, that yeah. Wasn't, that was never a question. <laughs> so we must be off. Good day to you, your highness. She curtsied, the red and blue gems in her belt sparkling in the sun. She looked over... Okay, so red and blue are festive colors? And she's wearing, like, what? For Samhain? Peacock? For peak, Yeah. What... What about this color combination is festive for an autumn festival? I don't know. This seems more like a, a Christmas dress of some sort. She looked over her shoulder, giving Dorian a sneer as she led the princess deeper into the garden. Dorian glared at Kaol. Thanks for your help. His boyfriend clapped him on the shoulder. You think that was bad? You should see them when they really get going. With that, he strode after the women. Dorian wanted to yell to pull out his hair. He'd enjoyed seeing Elysicles the other night, enjoyed it immensely, but for the past few weeks he'd gotten caught up in the council meetings and holding court and he hadn't been able to visit her. Were it not for the feast, he'd go to her again. He hadn't meant to annoy her with his talk about the dress, though it was outdated. It's, we get it. The dress is outdated. It's also a fucking horrible color combination. That is not indicative of Samhain at all. See, I'm over here like red and peacock go well together. Why is the why is the blue just kind of tossed in there as well? Like either it needs to be all cool tones or you have the red to contrast and pop out. Yeah. You don't have red and blue. That's muddied and confusing. Anyway, pff, fucking fashion in this book isn't even good. Well, okay, you can have red and blue stares directly at all your All Might. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be patriotic about yeah. the fucking French or wherever else this is supposed to be taking place. Uh. Not for fall. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not festive. Unless and also, they have 4th of July here. <laughs> you'll notice that All Might has red and blue, and then his accent color is yellow, another primary color. His ass is not in peacock green, red yeah. and blue. Yeah, I know. But you said just red and red and blue together, and I'm all like, no, that it usually goes together. If there's like, um... Oh, I, I misspoke. I meant red and blue together with the peacock green. Mm. Yeah. Not just red and blue. Yeah, like, uh, there's a... There's actually a very interesting uh, psychological thing that happens when a character is dressed in primary colors. It, you basically immediately like them. Yeah. Um, that's I mean, that's why, why so many super. Oh. Oh yeah, that's why so many superheroes. But also, like, in the early days of color, like main characters were usually dressed in those colors also a lot of mascots like brand mm -hmm. icons yep. you know mario yep uh it's there's it, a lot of red and pokemon red and blue yep and, <laughs> and yellow, yellow. 
Yeah, like uh, there. How deep does the conspiracy go? It's it's just very much psychologically a primary colors activate something in your brain that makes you know a character more likable. Basically, it probably helps that a lot of toys and things for babies are also typically primary colors. Yeah, well, and also generally this does tend to mostly be used with stuff for children. Like, Snow White is dressed in red, blue, and yellow. I'd be really interested to look into the history of, you know, early color film and color printing um, to see if, like, I feel like there's probably a very practical reason for a lot of this stuff, being Mm -hmm. that red and blue dyes are probably just the easiest ones to produce, and... Well, that then feeding into that nostalgic liking the, of things from early one of childhood. One the original coloring ways, like when it comes to coloring film, uh, the two strip coloring was red and blue. So a lot of you you see a lot of uh, before Technicolor came in, it was two strip, and that was, you know, they those were the colors that they kind of used. So I'd yeah. really be interested in, you know, if, if we were to do research on this and finding out how much of it is a part of the way our physiology is designed with our eyes being able to see red and blue very clearly mm-hmm. as compared to some other mammals. Yeah. And how much it is a societal thing of red and blue being easy colors to reproduce and therefore appearing often in society in ways that make us feel safe and secure also, such as with yeah. baby clothes and things like that also they're just colors that very much stand out in in response to s- normal natural surroundings like you know dorothy from the wizard of oz originally she had silver shoes in the books but they were changed to red for the technicolor because they would pop more so once again, she is a character that's dressed primarily in blue and red. Yep. And she's a main character. And she's, and she's likable. <laughs> so it's just... Fun things to fun, explore. Fun things to explore. <laughs> anyway, back to this. Mm. Nor had he known that she'd be that irritated about not being invited to the feast, but... Dorian scowled and walked off to the kettle. Okay, so this is just the chapter of trailing sentences. Yeah. Where the SJM clearly just didn't know how to end the sentence, so she just puts an ellipses or an M dash, and then that's the end of that sentence. Okay, but a follow-up with that is that she is dressed in, in with the red and blue accents, but her primary color is green, which is envy, because she can't go to the party. You're definitely thinking about that way more than anyone else is. I know, but it could have been it, a so it could have been a subconscious thing because green does seem to be a color that she ends up in pretty frequently. Yeah, it's it's a it could be very much a subconscious thing that Moss did. I'm not giving her credit by any means in this, and if she did do it on purpose, then I mean, hey, you got one, you got one. But oftentimes, a lot of how we color characters uh it is a subconscious thing sort of like how i typically dress llewellyn in purple because he's supposed to be kind of a pseudo royal mm-hmm. yeah like it's it's a thing that is very much ingrained in our brains from very early on color theory it's not just for art Color theory, it's not just for painting your hospital floors. <laughs> Shut. <laughs> All right. POV Tildy, back to Alyssacles. I really wish that they would either do the thing where they end the chapter with POVs or not. Because that, that one like chapter that was only like a page and a half is, is living right yeah. free in my head forever. Also, the only reason why we got this was so that we could get all this um, exposition dumping about what's going on with Elway. Man, wouldn't it have been great if Dorian's POV was just the meeting where that happened? 
Yep. If that was the only purpose that this was going to serve anyway. Or better yet, why don't we get a Nehemia POV? I don't know if I trust SJM enough to write that. I know, but, <laughs> but I would still... like her to try. Alyssa Cleese smiled to herself, running a finger across a neatly trimmed hedge. She thought the dress was lovely. Festive indeed. What's wrong with being festive? How is it festive about... Okay. No, no, your highness, Kaol was saying to Nehemia, slow enough that she could understand. I'm not a soldier. I'm a guard. There is no difference, the princess retorted, her accent thick and a bit unwieldy. Watch yourself. Stop. You stop right there. <laughs> Still, Kaol understood enough to bristle, and Elisicles could hardly contain her glee. She had managed to see Nehemia a fair amount over the past two weeks, mostly just for brief walks and dinners, where they discussed what it was like for Nehemia to grow up in Elway, what she thought of Rifthold, and who at court had managed to annoy the princess that day, which, to Elisicles' delight, was usually everyone. I'm not trained to fight in battles, Kaol replied through his teeth. You kill on the orders of your king. Your king. Nehemia might not be fully versed in their language, but she was smart enough to know the power of saying those, wor those two words. Your king, not hers. While Elisicles could listen to Nehemia rant about the king of Adderlin for hours, they were in a garden. Other people might be listening. A shudder went through Elisicles, and she interrupted before Nehemia could say more. I think it's useless arguing with her, Kaol. Elisicles said, nudging the captain of the guard with her elbow. Perhaps you shouldn't have given Terran your title. Can you reclaim it? It'd prevent a lot of confusion. How do you remember my brother's name? She shrugged, not quite understanding the gleam in his eye. You told me. Why wouldn't I remember it? He looked handsome today. It was in the way his hair met his golden skin, in the tiny gaps between the strands, in the way it fell across his brow. What a non sequitur. Yeah. The straights are at it again. <laughs> By the way, have we mentioned how hot Kaol is today? I suppose you'll enjoy the feast. Without me there, that is, she said morosely. He snorted. Are you that upset about missing it? No, she said, sweeping her unbound hair over a shoulder. But, well, it's a party, and everyone loves parties. Shall I bring you a trinket from the revelry? Only if it consists of a sizable portion of roast lamb. The air was bright and clear around them. The feast isn't that exciting, he offered. It's the same as any supper. I can assure you that the lamb will be dry and tough. You said it was debauchery earlier. Are we getting blackjack and hookers or not? <laughs> as my friend, you should either bring me along or keep me company. Friend? he asked. She blushed. Well, scowling escort is a better description, or reluctant acquaintance if you prefer. To her surprise, he smiled. The princess grabbed Elisicles' hand. You'll teach me, she said in Elway. Teach me how to better speak your language, and teach me how to write and read it better than I do now, so I don't have to suffer through those horribly boring old men they call tutors. So they just had that whole exchange right in front of her, and I guess she's just not going to comment on it. I, Elisicles began in the common tongue and winced. She felt guilty for leaving Nehemia out of the conversation. Oh, never mind. I was mistaken. They are going to talk about it. SJM 1, which is actually like negative 154, but hey, it's... It's something. It was one, negative 155 a minute ago, so... She felt guilty for leaving Nehemia out of the conversation for so long, and having the princess be fluent in both languages would be great fun. But convincing Kaol to let her see Nehemia was always a hassle, because he insisted on being there to keep watch. He'd never agree to sitting through lessons. I don't know how to properly teach you my language, Selena Elisicles lied. Nonsense, Nehemia said. You'll teach me after whatever it is you do with this one for an hour every day before supper. Nehemia raised her chin in a way that suggested saying no wasn't an option. Elisicles swallowed and did her best to look pleasant as she turned to Kaol, who observed them with raised brows. She wishes me to tutor her every day before supper. I'm afraid that's not possible, he said. 
she translated. Nehemia gave him the withering glare that usually made people start sweating. Why not? She fell into Elway. She's smarter than most of the people in this castle. Kael thankfully caught the general gist of it. I don't think that... Am I not princess of Elway? Nehemia interrupted in the common tongue. Your Highness, Kael began, but Elisicles silenced him with a wave of her hand. They were approaching the clock tower, black and menacing as always, but kneeling before it was Cain. His head bent, he focused on something on the ground. At the sound of their footsteps, Cain's head shot up. He grinned broadly and stood. His hands were covered in dirt, but before Elisicles could better observe him or his strange behavior, he nodded to Kael and stalked away behind the tower. "'Nasty brute!' Elisicles breathed, still staring in the direction in which he'd disappeared. "'Who is he?' Nehemia asked in Elway. "'Do they constantly have to remind us which language she's in? Can we just assume that she's speaking Elway unless Kael yeah. responds?' "'A soldier in the king's army,' Elisicles said, "'though he now serves Duke Parrington.' Nehemia looked after Cain, and her dark eyes narrowed. Something about him makes me want to beat in his face. Elisicles laughed. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Kale said nothing as he began walking again. She and Nehemia took up behind him, and as they crossed the small patio in which the clock tower stood, clock towel? <laughs> well, that doesn't sound very odd. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, I want to rewatch that for Halloween. Elisicles looked at the spot where Cain had just been kneeling. He dug out the dirt picked in the hollows of the strange mark in the flagstone, making the mark clearer. "'What do you think this is?' she asked the princess, pointing at the mark etched into the tile. And why had Cain been cleaning it? "'A word mark,' the princess replied, giving it a name in Elisicles' own language. Elisicles' brows rose. It was just a triangle inside of a circle." "'Can you read these marks?' she asked. "'A word mark. How strange!' "'No,' Nehemia said quickly. "'They're a part of an ancient religion that died long ago.' "'What religion?' Elisicles asked. "'We're getting a lot of religion, and all of it vague.' <laughs> "'Look, there's another!' She pointed out another mark a few feet away. It was a vertical line with an inverted peak stretching upward from its middle. "'You should leave it alone,' Nehemia said sharply, and Elisicles blinked. Such things were forgotten for a reason. What are you talking about? asked Kael, and she explained the gist of their conversation. When she finished, he curled his lip, but said nothing. They continued on, and Elisicles saw another mark. It was a strange shape, a small diamond with two inverted points protruding from either side. The top of and bottom peaks of the diamond were elongated into a straight line, and it seemed to be symmetrically perfect. Had the king had them carved when he built the clock tower, or did they predate it? Well, if they're carved into the stone, I don't really, uh... Oh, maybe they're, like, on the ground around. Mm. The... I don't know. This isn't really being described all that well. Nehemia was staring at her forehead, and Elisicles asked, Is there dirt on my face? No, Nehemia said a bit distantly, her brows nodding as she studied Elisicles' brow. The princess suddenly stared into Elisicles' eyes with a ferocity that made the assassin recoil slightly. You know nothing about the word marks? The clock tower chimed. No, Elisicles said. I don't know anything about them. You're hiding something, the princess said softly in Elway, though it was not accusatory. You are much more than you seem, Lillian. I, well, I should hope I'm more than just some simpering courtier. She said with as much bravado as she could muster. She grinned broadly, hoping Nehemia would stop looking so strange and stop staring at her brow. Can you teach me how to speak L.A. properly? If you can teach me more of your ridiculous language, said the princess, though some caution still lingered in her eyes. What had Nehemia seen that caused her to act that way? It's a deal, Elisicles said with a weak smile. Just don't tell him. Captain Westfall leaves me alone in the mid-afternoon. The hour before supper is perfect. Then I shall come tomorrow at five, Nehemia said. The princess smiled and began to walk once more, a spark appearing in her black eyes. Elisicles could only follow after her. It's 
So once again, I want more Nehemia. She's probably one of the best characters in the entire series. Yep. I know I'm not going to read the whole series, but I do feel confident in saying that now. And my guess is that Alyssa Cleese has some kind of invisible word mark on her forehead that only Nehemia can see because... Ooh. Mm. Like, clearly there's something to do with the word marks, which clearly have something to do with magic. Which is supposed to be banned, I think. Yeah. Like, like that's the whole thing. Adderlin got rid of magic. Yeah. And just knowing SJM, Alyssa Cleese is probably some kind of fae. Yeah. Or the princess of the magic kingdom or whatever. Like, she's definitely a princess. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll just have to figure out what all that was about at a later date. So there were some snippets of, like, actual interesting things in this chapter. Um, they just were not focused on or highlighted in a way that I feel is good prose. But there's some, there's concepts of a plan here. Yeah. <laughs> if you saw the debate, you, he he ha ha. Um, <laughs> it's late and I'm getting a little bit sleepy, so. <sighs> Again. It's not that I hate everything, it's that I hate the execution of everything, because it's all done badly. <laughs> and that, yeah, pretty much. And that's the whole book, but that's chapter 23. We'll be back. We're nearing the halfway point. Oh my god. And things have really not... Well, okay, I don't want to say that things have not been moving or happening, because... They have been, but the, prob- the characters aren't focusing on them at all. Well, the problem is that it, there'll be a chapter where things happen, and then things grind to a halt for four chapters, and then start moving again. Yeah, and that grinding to a halt isn't even giving the characters time to react to the thing that happened, because they don't. There have been multiple murders at this point, and no one seems to really give that much of a shit. Yeah. Aside from sometimes Kaol, because he's supposed to be investigating, doesn't seem like he's doing that anymore. He's just like, oh, well, dead is dead. Like, no one seems to be treating Elisicles with any degree of suspicion about any of this. They haven't even bothered asking her to try to, you know, hey, you were the top assassin in the country. No, she's a jewel thief, remember? Well, yeah, but I mean, they know the truth. Yeah. So you would think that they might, you know, Kayal might meet with her privately and be like, here's the details that we have. Can you think of any way in which the culprit could have snuck in and done this? Like, you know... Actually using some of her expertise to try to solve this mystery. No, that At least be... that would be something. Yeah, that would be, you know, expecting her to actually do things. Other than occasionally, randomly look like a badass. And then go back to whining and throwing up. Yeah, and it's... Okay. Again... A big reason why we keep harping on this so much, and if you're at this point, I assume that you are also, you know, ready to listen to it and harp on it, but let me just reread you the back cover, because, okay, this is the plot that was pitched, right? This is the thing that they're using to get you interested in picking the book up. This is the blurb, the all-important blurb. Two men love her. The whole land fears her. Only she can save them all. In a world without magic... False. The world has magic. The country is simply bandit. An assassin is summoned to the castle. Just the castle. Of the world? Which castle? Whose castle? She comes not to kill the vicious king who rules from his throne of glass. Oh, they said it. Roll credits. But to win her freedom. If she defeats 23 killers, thieves, and warriors in a competition, she'll be released from prison to serve as the king's champion. Her name is Selina Sardothian. 
So already this blurb fucking sucks. But again, what are we bringing up as the core plot? The thing that they're trying to get you interested with? 23, defeat 23 people in a competition. That is the main hook that we're given. The crown prince will provoke her. The captain of the guard will protect her. And a princess from a faraway land will befriend her. But something evil dwells in the castle, and it's there to kill. When her competitors start dying one by one, Selena's fight for freedom becomes a fight for survival and a desperate quest to root out the evil before it destroys her world. So we do have that kind of murder mystery subplot, but it is secondary to the contest and is kind of bookended with this contest, right? It's her competitors are dying. Her fight for freedom, the contest, becomes a fight for survival. The whole defeat 23 other champions to win this contest and become the king's champion is throughout this. One would not believe, just from reading this blurb, that it is going to be completely superseded by, like, two or three other plots, some of which are not even mentioned here. I have to assume that the blurb was not written by Moss, but was written by some, like... Some, some marketing person. Some marketing person who was given a random five chapters to read. Probably five chapters that actually advanced the plot. Um, and they were all like, write a blurb about it. Yeah, so it's... It's not, it's not a great blurb. Um, and I mean, I'm not fantastic at blurbs, but... No one is. <laughs> I've done enough research because, you know, I actually seek out resources to help me get better at the things that I'm not good at. And this does not pass the sniff check for, like, most of the... Like, having her name be the last thing in the first paragraph. You kind of want that in the first sentence. Mm -hmm. At least the beginning of the first paragraph. Like, come on. Anyway, okay, I think that's enough critique for one night. We're going to go ahead and end it here. If you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us by buying our books, joining the Patreon subscribing to the channel you know there's a billion things you can do that actually do really help us out if not from a monetary perspective then just from a morale boost perspective and we do appreciate that thanks for watching the video thanks for listening to us ramble and hope we'll see you next week bye bye thank you so much for watching and a special thank you to my patrons if you'd like to see your name here or in the description below please consider joining my patreon your support means so much to me and allows me to continue making content. If you want to support my content in different ways, consider buying my books, donating on coffee, subscribing to the channel, or even just giving this video a like and comment. Any and everything is appreciated so much. Keep growing till next time, Rose Garden!